Great. All right, hi everybody. Uh, so my name is Sarah McAnulty. Uh, I run the Skype a Scientist program. Um, and uh, there we go, we've got our scientists here. Give me just one second to get those two um, visible to you all. And Megan, I'm gonna get you co-host so you can turn your camera on. Great. Sounds good, thank you. All right, you should be able to be visible now. Uh -huh. Great. Awesome, hello, welcome. Um, so hey everybody, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today we are gonna be talking all about vaccines, antibodies, um, and how important those are to your immune system. I'm really glad you're all here. Thank you so much, Megan and Jay, for, for being with us today. Thank you. Great. So. Um, Everybody at home, these sessions are almost entirely based on your curiosity. So if you have questions, please submit them to the Q&A and we'll get to them after we do a brief introduction um, of Megan and Jay. So do you two wanna introduce yourselves, say who you are, what you do and why you like it? Hi, I'm Jay Chaplin. I'm head of immunology research and innovation for Abcam. Um, I've worked in a number of small startups and in large pharma companies. I've been here for a little over a year. Um, I love my job and it's a very weird one because I operate in the overlap between several very specialized areas. I, I use cell engineering, CRISPR, that kind of thing, changing the genome of cells in order to make them more immunogenic, less immunogenic and monkey with the immune system to get the desired output. Um, so I've worked on vaccine projects, I've worked on transplantation tolerance, autoimmunity, and yeah, happy to discuss whatever, whatever your interest is. Great. Could you tell us what it means to be immunogenic? Ah. Good question. That's a good, that's a very good question. And there's a lot of finesse there. Um, for something to be immunogenic, it means that if you introduce it into an animal, that animal will have an immune response to it. It will recognize that thing as not itself and reject it. That can mean a number of things. Uh, it can mean that you form antibodies against it, persistent proteins in your blood that flag that thing as foreign and break it down. It can mean that there's cell-based immunity, T cells that recognize that um, foreign thing inside of one of your cells and then kill off your own cells. So there's to eliminate a hiding place for say viruses or cancer. There are a number of different components, but um, the main ones are that you have to have T cell responses showing that this thing is foreign and you have to have some pattern that broadly shows that it is foreign. They, they come together. The, the immune system is an incredibly complex, for lack of a better term, system, in that it, it has been generated to, over the course of evolution, recognize anything that is not you and nothing that is you. And that's a pretty tall order. Um, we can talk more about that if, if people want to. Yeah, yeah I think I after the introductions, questions. we might want to do, like, what is an immune system? Uh, in general before, and then maybe like, what is a T cell and that sort of thing. So um, yep. yeah, let's let's hear uh, Megan's introduction first. So my name is Megan Kelly. I am a scientific team lead at APM. I've basically grown up at APM. I've been here or at the company that was acquired by APM for eight or nine years now. Um, and I think what I love the most about my job is that no day is ever the same and I get to take part in some really fun and like evolving science to change the face of what we're trying to do. Very cool. Awesome. So yeah, I guess before we get started, can we just give a primer like what is an immune cell? What is an antibody? Um, and how does this all work to help keep us safe and healthy? <laughs> um, it, that sounds like such a lovely, simple question. I'm, I'm trying to think of where to start with that. 
we don't we don't normally think of it, but your immune system actually every cell in your body in one way, shape, or form functions as a part of your immune system in the sense that there are receptors on there are proteins on on every cell of your body that sense certain things that don't belong there. There are for instance, some of the fats that make up the membrane, the outer surface of bacteria, don't ever occur in an animal. And so if your body is exposed to some of those, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, is, is an example of that. It only occurs in bacteria, it doesn't occur in animals. There are receptors in your body that if they see that, they will sound an alarm. That's actually part of the reason why you end up getting a fever if you're infected. That's not, that's not the germ causing the disease doing that to you. That's your immune system sounding the alarm, there's something wrong. That then primes another bunch of cells in your body that generally look for debris. They just gobble up anything and everything. They're sort of like amoebas. We call those macrophages or dendritic cells. They fall into that function. They generally eat stuff, chop it up, and show it on their surface, basically saying, this is all the crud that I ate. Check in and see if it's, if it's us or not. Right. Because they also recycle parts of your body well. T cells, or thymic-derived cells, they, they come out of the bone marrow, they go into your thymus, and they get educated there through a bizarre process that could be an hour by itself to talk about. Um, they are the gatekeepers of what is and is not you. Right. They have receptors on their surface that look for particular proteins. And any of them, when they're in the thymus getting educated, that recognize a piece of you get killed off. And so there's a hole shaped like you in your immune system. And anything outside of that is assumed to be foreign. So these T cells then look at the garbage on these amoeba like macrophages and dendritic cells. They see this isn't you. It's not in the hole that's you. It must not be you. And then they give approval to B cells, which make antibodies are sort of like Velcro flags that bind to whatever that cell recognizes, and it can only get approval if it's not you. Marking that thing for destruction, if it lived outside of one of your cells, if it's swimming around in your bloodstream by itself, if it's hiding inside of your cells, there's another kind of T cell. I told you it's complicated. This might be a little too much detail, um, but broadly speaking, immune systems, they determine what's what should be there or what shouldn't be there. And then through a huge bureaucratic cellular process of many steps checking each other, like, okay, that should be destroyed, that's okay. And then and then we go from there. So Absolutely. I don't think we need to know about the different types of cells because I, I think a lot of our audience um may still be learning what like what a cell is um but so so if if some of that went over your head folks at home don't worry uh you do not need to know what a t-cell b-cell t-helper tk mk killer what I, like don't worry about all that basically it's a it's a wide system of different types of cells that all have very specific roles and talk to each other in order to to make sure that we stay healthy because like jay said keep figuring out what's you and what's not you is pretty complicated, not only because we are covered with bacteria and have bacteria all in our gut, many of which aren't us, but they help us a lot and we don't want to destroy them. So the immune system is constantly walking a very, very fine line between accidentally being a little too overzealous and hurting us and not doing their job enough and letting nasty stuff in that lets us get sick. So it's like, it's a very delicate balance between these two. Um, and that's the challenge of the immune system. So um, let's see. So before we go into questions, I think the one other thing that we should really cover is what is a vaccine? 
I think first, maybe like a little bit about what is an antibody and then what is a vaccine and how do vaccines give us antibodies or, or help us to create antibodies that we otherwise would not have had. Yeah, sure. So an antibody, if we can start with that, because it'll lead nicely into what a vaccine is, is basically a protein that binds other proteins very specifically. Um, that antibody can then be used for multiple different purposes down the stream. Within your body, it's used for one thing, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, I'm sure, with Jay. We can also use it as a diagnostic in the lab. Um, we can bind it to other things and be able to fluorescently label certain things. There's a broad use for antibodies, and it's kind of about how you want to engineer it for its own use. Yeah, effectively, uh, antibodies in your system, it's just, this is a thing that it's like a post-it note that sticks to all the various stuff floating around your body as, hey, this is something we have to deal with uh, in one shape or another. Um, okay, and then how do vaccines help our bodies make new antibodies that we don't otherwise have. So, so one of the things that, that's important to understand about how the immune system works, and not to dive into detail, it goes incredibly broad, incredibly broad. So when you're born, when, when you're young, you may have, before you're exposed to a particular germ, you might have only one cell in your entire body that can recognize that particular germ. If that's the case, it takes a long time for that one cell circulating through your body to find that germ and start to respond to it. So when you first get exposed to a virus, let's say, let's say I was never vaccinated against the measles and I got exposed to it, it could take up to a week for my immune system to start recognizing and fighting off the measles virus, which is a problem because by that time you can be seriously Crazy. sick and it's really hard to catch up. But what your immune system is trained to do is that once it's done fighting that, that germ off, a lot of those cells die off but not all of them. And so now instead of having one that recognizes the measles virus, now you've got 200,000. And they're distributed all throughout your body and they're primed and ready to go. So instead of taking a week to respond to the virus, now it takes 12 hours. Right. And so that, that's what we call immune memory. And you only get that when your immune system has seen its target and gone through this response. Right. Now, what a vaccine is, it, in broad terms, all a vaccine is, is a disabled germ. It can be a part of it, it can be just a protein, it can be, in the case of some of the COVID vaccines, uh, the, the genetic code to make one of those proteins, it can actually be one of these viruses. The measles vaccine is a live virus, but it's been engineered so that it can't make you sick. It'll infect you, but it can't make you sick. And all of these are essentially training grounds for your immune system so that if you get exposed again, your body can deal with it very quickly instead of very slowly. And every time you get a booster, you get a better immune response. Right. Awesome. So we have a really great question um, that I think has been talked about a lot, particularly the last two years. Um, this is from sixth and seventh grade STEM Magnet Academy. If you have a very good immune system, um, however we define good in this case, will that affect how a body deals with a new virus or bacterium? That is a really good question. It will. Yeah. This is one of those things that's hard to define. And, and I apologize because it, it's, again, it seems like a simple question. When we talk about what is a good immune system, if you mean that your immune system is primed and ready to go, ready to respond to anything, that actually means that you'll probably feel sick all of the time. When we talk of, when you, when you hear about a, a health food supplement that's supposed to boost your immune system, 
if that were possible, you would feel like you had the flu all day, every day of your life. And that's actually not what we want. No. Um, what we really want is a specific immune response that's protective. And again, that's where vaccines are very helpful. In terms of generally boosting immune function, that's a very, very difficult teeter-totter as, as Sarah was saying, because if you go too far in the other direction, if your immune system is, is set to react to, to everything, you run a risk of developing an autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis or lupus, where your immune system will go haywire and it will start to attack the rest of your body, which is just as bad, if not worse. Right. And, right. So it's, there's a reason why the immune system is so tightly regulated and, and linked together because you can't not have it work, you'll die. And you can't have it work too well, you'll die. You'll die. <laughs> Very fine line. Very yeah, immunology fine. is truly a place for nuance because it's just it's just not it's not simple um, and dangerous either way. So you have to be perfectly tuned to be healthy. Um, and so if you know a good immune system is so hard to define for that reason. Um, all right, the next question uh, is going to be from Jameson. This is an interesting question. Why do you have to get the COVID vaccine twice or three times? Whereas the flu shot, you just get once a year at least. Or maybe we can say like the polio shot, you just get once. Like why some one, why some three, what's the deal? So that in part has to do with the kind of vaccine it is. So we have three different COVID vaccines licensed in the United States. Two of them use genetic material to code for one of the proteins in COVID-19. Those aren't as strong of a stimulus for your immune response. They don't make as good memory. And so we need more boosts to get to the same place. Um, and, and there's a lot more than I could say about that. The other one, the J&J &J vaccine, takes a live harmless virus and puts one COVID protein into that. That is a stronger, easier way to generate immune memory. And so that only requires one dose, whereas the other vaccines require multiple doses. Cool. That's, um, and, yeah, there's a lot more to say there. Yeah, uh, again, this is like one of these, it, a lot of times we learn from trying it out. Like when a scientist is developing a new vaccine, what they're looking at over time is how much antibody is floating against whatever thing we're working with is floating around in your blood a month later, three months later, six months later. And so it's not as though a scientist says, okay, I've developed this type of vaccine today. And that means I just know that we're only going to need one. I know we're only going to need two. Um, this is the kind of thing that it's, it's sort of hard to predict. So you, you give it to a thousand people and then every couple months you test their blood and on, on average see how much their body is still producing those antibodies and so that's why particularly like living through the covid pandemic has been a great lesson in how we learn things because as it's been going on the messaging has been changing because we're learning things as we go and so whereas before they were like okay we think we're gonna need two shots and then we'll see, but we didn't have enough time to see well, what happens in a year. And so now we're like, okay, we are looking at all these people who've gotten the vaccine. We see how much antibody is currently in their blood. And we see that in our little test group that we gave a third shot to, those folks are super better protected than the ones that got two and left it at that. And so that's kind of how we're learning um, how that all works. Um, okay, the next question is from Josie. Uh, will mRNA vaccines become the dominant vaccine type moving forward? A lot of people are very excited about mRNA vaccines right now. And that means that a lot of money is being put into that kind of vaccination path in terms of research and trials. I'm sure we'll see more of them. 
However, there's not much difference functionally between an mRNA vaccine and a, a protein subunit vaccine where, where you would take just a protein from the COVID-19 virus and inject that as opposed to the genetic material to code for that. They end up being pretty similar. Um, it's faster and easier to produce mRNA vaccines, but they're not better necessarily. Um, I, I don't think that they're really going to change the nature of vaccine technology. Yeah, like there might be some vaccines that end up using mRNA technology and then others that are using the same type of vaccine technology that we've had for 40 years or whatever. Yeah. Um, again, like it's every disease that we're trying to beat is different and therefore the vaccine will be different. And it's just, it's also complicated. Um, all right. So oh, here we go. A question from Hudson Lab Middle School. How does a vaccine work when a person has already been infected with a disease? Is it more or less effective? In general, it's more effective. And and I have to say in general, because there, there are some issues there. So just like with, with a regular vaccine, you get a first dose and then you'll get a booster and then you'll get another booster. And every time you get another exposure, your immune system gets trained to respond to that germ more strongly. In the same way, at least in theory, if you have the disease first and then you get the vaccine, you'll get a stronger and stronger immune response. Now, that being said, the germs that cause disease for us have developed ways to get around being sensed by the immune system. They've, many of them have different ways of tricking the immune system or causing problems one way or another. Measles, for instance, the measles virus kills off any active immune cells while it's in your body. And so it makes its own hole in your immune system, the shape of the measles virus. So in that case, if you get if you get the measles, you really don't have particularly good protection. The vaccine is way better. The virus that causes COVID-19 does something a little bit similar. It actually turns on a pathway that stimulates your immune system. And you would think that this would make your immune response better, but it actually makes it kind of exhausted. And so it doesn't do so well. And so you get a really strong response. You think you get good protection, but then you have poor memory. And if you get infected with COVID-19, your protection only tends to last nine months or maybe a year, whereas the protection from the vaccines looks to be substantially longer than that. Sounds good, thank you. Um, here's a really fun and interesting question that is also gonna be complicated, but I think is worth tackling. Um, we've got a question from Clarendon Elementary School. Why have scientists not come up with a vaccine for cancer? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so, I, I think the thing that's important to recognize here, and, and that is a fantastic question, there are many places we could go. I think the most important thing to recognize is that cancer is not a disease. Cancer is an umbrella that underneath it has many, many, many hundreds of different kinds of disease. And even if we're talking about, say, a particular kind of brain cancer, there can be dozens of different causes for it. And so each one has its own particular thing that you have to address in order to recognize it or fix it. And so coming up with a vaccine for cancer, which is an area that's, that has massive active research right now, I've, I worked on several of those as well. Um, those kinds of approaches, they're targeted at very specific types of cancer, and some of them have done really, really well. Um, but to talk about a vaccine for cancer is kind of like talking about a vaccine for all viruses. And that's a very tall order because you have to find something that's common to all of them and not to you 
which is the other problem with cancer because cancer starts as a part of you. And so there's very little that your immune system can hone in on that occurs as different from you when you start with something that is you. Does that make sense? Yeah, effectively, cancer is not one thing. Cancer is a bazillion different things that all, each individual that gets cancer is kind of unique. And some cancers are actually caused by viruses. And so for those, those are you have vaccines, like uh, yes. cervical cancer um, is originally caused by a virus. And so if anyone, if any of you have ever had a Gardasil vaccine, I think you get it when you're like 11, 12. Um, that will prevent the virus that causes cervical cancer. And so in the last, I think like 15 years, there's been a huge decrease in cervical cancer because of this vaccine. So it's not like a vaccine for cancer, but it's a vaccine to stop the thing that causes the cancer. So um, it's all very complicated, but that's one example of a vaccine that prevented cancer, even if not directly. Um, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, all right, so we've got a question from Tina. Um, what is the process for testing vaccines and making sure that they're safe? Are a really, really difficult thing to test. Efficacy is the hardest problem with testing. Safety is, is actually a lot easier in the sense that it, I, I don't know if if you're all aware of this, when there's a clinical trial happening and someone has been given what's called an investigational compound, whether that's a vaccine or a drug candidate, something like that, anything and everything that happens to someone in the clinical trial is put in as if it could be a side effect. If you're in one of those clinical trials and you get hit by a car and you die, it goes into the list of potential effects. That's why you've got on the product inserts that long list of headaches and this and that and the other. Everything gets listed. Um, the main thing is that for generally a three-year follow-up period, they look at the folks who received the fake compound. And this is, this is where the ethics get spooky because if you're trying to test something that could protect people from death, you have to give some of them a non-treatment to be your comparison. They don't have any protection. That's, that's ethically dangerous. And then you have your test group and you look at those two for a period of at least three years and see how all of those different possible side effects compare. And if there's generally more than about a half a percent increase in a side effect in your treated group versus your untreated group, then it comes up as a safety flag. Now, if it's a regular vaccine, like for instance, when we, when we came up with the chickenpox vaccine, we could trial that over three years and do that comparison for the COVID vaccines they were pushed out fairly quickly. They looked for obvious safety problems that were as bad or worse than the disease that they were trying to prevent. And now we're in the post-approval marketing phase where we're still pulling together all the data on side effects and making sure that there aren't issues. So far, they've been very clean. Awesome, thank you. Um... Let's see. So we have so many questions here. Um, here's a question. Will this virus, COVID-19, stay around forever, um, but in the future, maybe not be as like society stopping as it is right now? I'm biased. I like vaccines. I think that they're fantastic. When they're done well, bad vaccines are bad. And there are some examples. But um, COVID is never going away. And I feel fairly safe in saying that because the family of viruses that it comes from, what we call beta coronaviruses, have been around for a long time. Um, 
there are beta coronaviruses that have been circulating worldwide and causing very mild disease for more than 50 years. We know how they work in general. This is just a particularly bad flavor of them. Most of these viruses basically cause what we would call a common cold. And people can get reinfected with them every single year, year after year. Um, they don't go away. Um, and this one is not going to go away either. We can do better with vaccinating so that there are fewer people who get infected and can pass it along. And we can tamp this down to a point where it's not a societal problem. But this disease is going to be with us moving forward permanently. Just like measles, we've only ever been able to eradicate two diseases in the history of humankind. Uh, we got smallpox and we got uh, a variant, actually the original strain from which measles came, Rinderpest, which was an animal virus. And we eliminated both of those with vaccines. Those are the only things that we've really gotten rid of. Yep. Well, one success is better than none, I guess. <laughs> a couple of successes is better than none. Here's a, here's a question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds. Um, this is from Jill. I've gotten both doses of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and I still got the virus. What is the deal with that? My aunt is in the same boat, uh, but my aunt's almost totally better now. Uh, and maybe she wouldn't have been if she didn't get the vaccine, but tell us a little bit more about that. So, so an important thing to recognize about vaccines is that they're not a black and white type of deal. It's not that once you have them, you cannot get sick. What vaccines do is they increase your resistance. And so if you took me and I had never had a vaccine for COVID and I had never been exposed and you injected me with say a thousand virus particles, I'll have a certain chance of getting sick. My immune system might be able to catch up with that and contain it, or it might not. And if they escape my immune system, then I'll get sick. But if, if you inject me with 100,000, the chances are higher. If you inject me with 100 million virus particles, the chances are much higher. And, and so somewhere on that curve, there's a level at which my immune system can sort of keep up with it and keep me from getting a disease. And so what happens when you take a vaccine is not that you're totally protected, but it shifts that over. And now you can be exposed to more and still not get sick. But there's always gonna be some point at which the exposure is so high that you're still gonna get hurt. I mean, it's kind of like putting on bulletproof armor. You're still gonna have some skin exposed. If, you, if somebody shoots at you enough times, you're still gonna get hurt. It just gives you more resistance. And so the, the vaccine increases your chances of resisting the virus and not getting sick. And if you get sick, it tends to be milder and you recover faster. So it's, it's definitely a benefit, but it's not that it completely protects you. Definitely not. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I think, do we wanna talk about the Swiss cheese model of protection right now? I think that's a keeper. I'm gonna pull it up uh, right now. Um, Cause I think it is the, the best way to explain why things are the way that they are right now, um, in my opinion. In the meantime, you are gonna answer this question. Um, how, so I'm gonna pull up the Swiss cheese model while you answer, answer Erica's question. How is the vaccine for younger kids different from the vaccines from adults that, and teens get? And why did it take so long to get it approved for kids? Okay, so the first part is the easiest part, I believe, um, and I'll have to go back and double check this, my apologies, but I'm pretty sure that the dose for pediatric uh, administration ages five to 11 is one third of the dose of that of teens and adults. Um, you would, you might think that it should be smaller. The doses of vaccines really have more to do with the number and type of immune cells in your body and not how big your body is. Um, I've done a lot of work with mice as model systems. And you would think that a mouse, mice, mice, mice are really tiny, really, really, really tiny. You would think that you would use a tiny amount of vaccine 
but you actually end up using about a tenth of what you do for a full size human adult. Yeah. So it doesn't scale the way that you think it does. The reason why it takes so long is because the FDA is weighing risk versus benefit. And the younger someone is and the healthier they are, the more they have to lose and the cleaner the side effect profile has to be. Um, so the younger the population that you look at, the longer their analysis takes, the more they look for side effects, the smaller the fraction of side effects that they'll allow. And it just makes everything more complicated, more expensive and take longer. It's, it's that way for any and all drugs, vaccines, everything else. Um, I was working on a treatment for type one diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease in kids. It was easy for us to get it out there for adults. It's very difficult for kids, even though that's where you need it. It's just the nature of the game. I love this model. I love this model. Yes, let's talk about the Swiss cheese, because we had a question. So for folks um, at home, we're getting more questions than I think we'll, we're gonna have time to answer. Um, I do have a PhD in molecular and cell biology and I did my PhD on immunology. So I'm answering questions like as quickly as I can uh, that, I, that we're not gonna get to, but one of them was about like, are we gonna have to wear masks forever? And um, I tried to explain like why masks, et cetera. But I think this model basically uh, explains the approach that we're all taking. Um, and so I don't know if Jay, you want to go through the Swiss cheese model. Um, so, so this the last one is a, is a bit of a misnomer because again, getting vaccinated doesn't give you amazing protection, but it gives you added protection. Um, it's a very good line of defense, way better than masks, way better than washing your hands, way better than avoiding large gatherings. However, each one of these contributes, even if every one of those slices of Swiss cheese had exactly the same number of holes in it, if you've got enough of them and they're, they're turned slightly differently, the holes won't match up and you can't get something through all of them all the way to you. And so every layer reduces your risk. Wearing a mask reduces your chances by about 30 to 50%. Is that great? No, but say 50% plus practicing social distancing, there's another 50%. Now you're down to a quarter of your chance of getting infected. Avoiding large gatherings gives you another layer. And every one of these adds on top of each other, even if the individual ones aren't much, when you put them all together, it's a very large impact. And so they're all useful. That being said, we're going to continue trying to improve and refine our vaccines. They will get better with time. We'll get better at the dosing. We'll get better at knowing how many boosters are necessary. And as time goes on, the vaccines will become more and more effective as we fine tune them. If we can get enough people vaccinated, there won't be as much virus circulating and we might be able to relax some of these, but Depending on where you live, vaccine status within the US is anywhere between 30 and 80%. If you're down toward the 30%, you gotta do it all. You gotta do it all. Awesome, the next question. Um, oh, this is a fun one. How cold does a vaccine need to be and why do vaccines need to be kept cold? Do all vaccines need to be kept cold? They all need to be kept cold to some extent, um, and those are for different reasons. If you're talking about if you're talking about a viral vaccine like measles, mumps, rubella, those are live viruses, and if they get too warm and stay too warm for too long, they'll they'll quit being effective, and they they won't be able to infect your body and cause a mild fake disease that trains your immune system. If you're talking about the mRNA vaccines for COVID, there, that genetic material is encased in a particular kind of fat that cloaks it and lets it get into your cell so it can do its work. And it's actually not the genetic material that's temperature sensitive, it's the fat that goes around it because if you warm it up too much and, and shake it around too much as a liquid, it's kind of like churning milk into butter. You, you get something different and it just doesn't work. 
Um, so the COVID vaccines, the mRNA ones, have to be kept really cold, and that's actually been a distribution challenge for these vaccines. The ones that are the least sensitive are the ones that are just protein um, with an adjuvant, like alum, something like that, like the diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus vaccine. That still has to be kept cold, but not that cold, and, and you've got a little more wiggle room. The only issue with that is when you've got a protein that you're injecting and you want your immune system to recognize it, it recognizes the outside of the protein and the shape. And like when you take an egg and you crack it into a pan and you cook it, it goes from clear to white. You change the shape of the proteins. And so if you're giving an unfolded protein in your vaccine, your immune system will recognize an unfolded protein, but that's not the way the germ is. The germ is all folded up. It shows a different surface. And so if you give a vaccine that's been out in the heat for too long, you'll be generating an immune response against the wrong thing and it won't protect you. Great, all right. Um, we've got a question from Clarendon Elementary. Do viruses affect our cellular DNA? In general, no, and there are exceptions. So, Most viruses carry their own genetic information. If it gets into a cell, they'll make copies of that, but it doesn't go backwards and get into your DNA. That being said, there are, there's one family of viruses, that what we call retroviruses. They actually go backwards. They start as RNA and then make a DNA copy. They jam that into your DNA which is how they hide out in your cells for long periods of time. And then they make RNA copies of themselves again. HIV is one of those. There are, there are a few others, but those are a very, very, very small fraction. Very few viruses, almost no viruses do that. That was a major discovery in the 80s. We didn't think it was possible before that. Awesome, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Why, okay, here's just a question about like your job generally. Um, what it, this is other been a couple questions about that the, from uh, the Valley School in fifth grade and some others. Why do you like your job? What's your favorite part of your job? And what motivated you to do the job that you do now? Right, this is one I can take, so I guess I'll do it. Um, so I think what motivated me to take the job that I have now is just the continuous need or want to, to solve problems. Um, science, that's really what that does. You continuously have an issue that you then gather data and conduct scientific experiments and then go back and try to see if you've either solved the question. And at the very least, if you haven't solved the question, you've gotten more evidence to be able to help you to further solve the question. Um, what I like most about my job is that I always have new questions and my day is never the same as what it was yesterday. So the projects that we're working on, they're always different. Um, and you always get the opportunity to work with different people, to interface with different groups outside of this organization. Um, this being an example where you can really help to drive through the importance of science in what we do and make it so that maybe somebody else will wanna go into science. Great. Um, Okie dokie, we've got, we did that one. Um, here's a question, have either of you ever done work testing on animals? And if so, what was the most interesting animal you tested on and what were the results? Of mice. Um, that's not a particularly interesting animal per se, at least to start with. Um, I, I've done I've done a little bit of work with more classically interesting animals like uh, lampreys and hagfish, slimy <laughs> slimy fish that uh, leech onto you and suck blood. Um, and a couple of other systems. I've worked with molds. I've worked with um, microbiological systems. But I, I have to say that 
even though mice don't seem like they'd be the place to go, there's a reason why they're the standard research animal, because there are so many varieties that have been engineered to do particular things. You can, you can track individual immune system cells through a mouse. You can crossbreed certain mice so that they develop essentially autoimmune diseases. I worked with lupus model mice where you, you can't look at human beings and test them to see if you can prevent lupus and autoimmune disease because so few people get it and there's really no way to tell. But you can, there are mouse strains that always get lupus. And so you have a way to investigate the disease that you can determine and you can get good numbers on and you can run a, a well-supported experiment and benefit human health in, in a way that you just can't with a general animal. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so we have been going for 47 minutes and we try to keep these to 45 minutes. So we've already gone over. I've just been trying to get to all these questions. So uh, we ask everybody the same two questions at the end of every session. I'm going to stop sharing the Swiss cheese model at this point. Um, and my question for both of you is um, if you had the opportunity, you had every, the attention of everyone in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would that be? <laughs> of course you are. What I would say is that there's always room for more, more of you to work in science. That what we can do is expanding dramatically. The things that I'm doing today, I could only dream of doing 10 years ago. And so we can always use fresh insight. We can always use new tools. We can always use new creativity. I've been at this for 17 years professionally, plus a lot of schooling. And I have ways that I think, you think differently. And if we are going to positively impact human health and well-being, that's what I'm here for. We need as much creativity and diversity of ideas, of expression, of experience, of background as we can get. And please come join us. Please come join us. We can't build a better world without you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'll compound on Jay's, which is that the, the term science is pretty vast. It's not just the immunology work that we talked about today. Um, there's a lot of chemistry involved, there's a lot of physics involved, and the biggest thing is, is that science includes all of them, right? So when I was first starting out, I didn't want to do biology because I thought biology was only looking in microscopes, and who wanted to do that all day? There are some people who do. Yep, Sarah says she wants to do it, <laughs> but that wasn't me. So it took me a lot of education and a lot of really good mentors to kind of show me that science and biology is much bigger than that. And it will give you a whole lot of opportunity that is not available if you just close your mind off to having that one view of what science is. So I would say that you should come, just like Jay said, and, and give your opinion and give your insight and give your perspective. But you should also be willing to look at it really holistically and want to see it from the bigger picture here, because that's how we actually be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish with better health. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for sharing all your knowledge um, and everything today. Uh, this has been really, really cool. Everybody at home, thank you so much for all of your questions. We got through 29 of them. We didn't get to 21 of them. Uh, we tried to rip through as many as we could. But um, we are going to be having another session this month about vaccines. Um, this is That one's going to be for adults, um, not for kids. But, um, you know, if you get, we're not going to do anything that's like not safe for kids. It's just the, the words we use might be a little more complicated. We're going to be having a scientist from the University of Pennsylvania uh, come talk to us. He is, uh, in fact, my friend, Mike Hogan. He um, was one of, he was on the team of first scientists 
who injected an mRNA vaccine into an animal. Like the first scientist to inject mRNA vaccines in animals, that's my friend, Mike. And we're gonna talk to him. Um, he's a delightful person, also from Philadelphia, which is where we're headquartered. Um, we'll be releasing information about that later this month. So if you didn't get your question answered, or if you have uh, slightly more complex questions that uh, we maybe didn't answer today because I thought uh, like a fifth grader wouldn't be able to understand the answer, that'll be the, the space to ask those questions. Um, and so thank you again for coming, uh, Jay and Megan. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and of course, thank you, Ashley, for signing for us. Uh, you are a champ. Uh, we will uh, see you all next week. Feel free to check out on skypescientist.com all about, uh, we'll be doing a session on green energy and batteries. Um, so check that out. Um, if you can support our program, please do. We rely completely on small donations uh, to exist. So you can support us at patreon.com slash scientist or directly um, this week, we actually just started a Venmo. So you can just Venmo at Skype a scientist. You can do that too. Um, thank you again. And we'll see you all next week. Goodbye.